Well, before we dive in, I just want to celebrate something. You, you may not know, but uh, Chandler and Avery Young, who are a part of our staff, we love them dearly, and they are here worshiping with us today for the first time as a family of three with their beautiful baby boy, Jensen, with them. What, 10 days old? Right? Get, get them in church early and often. I love it. But thinking about this sermon and them, I, it wasn't too long ago that I did their wedding. And looking across in the 9 o'clock service and seeing different couples that I was able to be a part of their wedding day and officiate that service, see multiple others as I look around and thinking about what that day means. How many of you have been to a wedding this year so far? Anybody been to a wedding this wedding season? Yeah, okay. On average, you will go to two weddings per year. Now, I know there's some where you're like, well, I didn't go to any this year. Well, I bet there was a period when all of your friends and family, and it felt like every weekend you were going to a wedding. On average, you'll go to two. And as we think about that, we know kind of the normal order of events. You, you'll get the save the date, you know, several months in advance because they want you to go and put it on the calendar. Go ahead and know what is coming. They want to remove any excuse that might keep you from being there on that day because of how special it is to them. How important. Then closer to time, you get the invitation in the mail. And once you receive that invitation, it puts responsibility back on the recipient, doesn't it? That now, once you've received that invitation, you have a job to do in that you need to send back your what? Your RSVP. And with modern technology, with you know, online services, the not and different things, when, when you get an invitation through that now with the you know, text messaging, it seems like about every 35 seconds you get a respond. It's time to RSVP. The wedding's coming up. It's time. You haven't RSVP'd yet. You need to RSVP over and over and over again with those services. Why? Because weddings are important. And they need to know, are, are you going to come? And as I planned and prepared for this sermon, I got to thinking about it. I've been to a lot of weddings, been in a lot of weddings, officiated a lot of weddings, sent in so many different RSVPs, and I have no clue what RSVP means. Anybody willing to th say, you know what, now that I think about it, I don't know what RSVP stands for. Well, it's a French term. And I thought about saying the exact French term. Those initials stand for the, the, the French letters in the term. But as I practiced it, a southern accent and French, they just don't go together. And I'm not going to do it, Scott. I'm just going to tell you that it translated in English, RSVP simply means respond, please. That's it. Respond, please. Here's the invitation. We want you to come and to be a part of whatever event this may be. Would you respond, please? Would you let us know if you're going to come? Why? Because weddings are important. They're a big deal just because of the occasion and what it means and what these people are professing before God and the witnesses present there. But here's the other thing why they want you to RSVP. Because they're outrageously expensive, aren't they? I thought if between the two services, I would have a, a father of the bride that would shout out amen at that moment, that weddings are crazy expensive. And so they want you to RSVP so that they know. Here's a couple more stats for you. For the average of the two weddings you go to a year, there's going to be about 115 people there attending. They're going to have a wedding party of about eight people on average, and there's going to be 14 vendors that were contracted to cover every single base and make sure it's the most perfect day possible for that bride and groom. But all of those 14 vendors cost money. That it breaks down between those 115 in attendance, it comes out to about $304 per person is the average cost of a wedding in America, or about $35,000 on average. So when you RSVP, there, there's some money that is at stake. They want to know, are you going to be here because it's going to cost us about $304 to put it on for you to be there. Of everyone that's invited, on average, 83% of people RSVP. 83% respond, please. 
And yet on the day of the wedding, of those 83% that RSVP'd, 5 to 10% no-show. So there's literally some money left on the table when you start breaking it down, when you no-show to a wedding. So let that be in your mind when you think about flaking on that Saturday afternoon. You RSVP'd, you responded, show up. This is vitally important. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I wanted to show us, yes, an RSVP in an actual wedding today, it's valuable. But as we're going to see today, spiritually speaking, there is an invitation that God has sent out to the world that he wants you to respond, please. There's an RSVP that is so much more important that we need to respond to in the gospel message. And so, if you have your copy of God's word, open up to Matthew chapter 22. And we're going to continue in this series, Encountering the King. And we encounter him in Matthew 22, giving a parable. I've talked about parables several times in this series, which is a, it's a story. It's a casting alongside where he takes a physical picture, compares it to a spiritual truth so that we can understand it better. And guess what physical picture he uses in this parable? A wedding feast. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like this wedding feast. And just like all of us have been to a wedding at different times, and you know and you have mental images and experiences that have come as a result of being at a wedding, these people did too. They knew what this was like. At a wedding feast At this time, but not just any wedding feast, as we're going to see in this parable, the wedding feast for the king's son. And in this context here in Matthew 22, Jesus is teaching in the temple in Jerusalem, and we're getting close to the cross. Now, there's that shift in the Gospels where Jesus turns and kind of faces Jerusalem as this picture of, hey, I'm I'm headed to what I came to do, to pay the price for sinners. He's making his way to Jerusalem. He's doing some final teachings. And, and specifically in this context, the, the Pharisees and the chief priests and these religious leaders, they've come up to him and confronted him while he's teaching. And they want to know, under whose authority are you doing this teaching? Who do you think you are to be able to stand here in this place and say some of the things that you're saying? And Jesus does what he does so many times in his teaching. He turns it back around. Who do you think you are? Begins to question them, begins to use parables to show, hey, I'll show you what you're like. I'll give you a parable and show you how you've responded to God and his grace and mercy time and time again. And that's what we have in Matthew 22. It says there in verse 1, and again, Jesus spoke to them. That's who he's speaking to, the Pharisees, the chief priests that have begun questioning him in 21 saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call on those who had been invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatted calves, they've all been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. They went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Verse 7, the king was angry. He sent his troops. He destroyed those murderers, and he burned their city. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time, Lord, your word, this place to worship Together as a family of believers, we thank you that we have been brought in to your family. That we can be fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. By your grace, through faith in this invitation, God, I pray today that we would see this incredible opportunity that you have given us to come into the feast. That that would be a reality for our lives here and now, and we will know that it's the reality for then and there. God, move in this place. I I pray if there are those here who have not, God, that they would respond, please. That they would surrender their lives to King Jesus in every way. That's what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
So for the next two weeks, we're going to be camped out in this passage. Matthew 22, we're looking at the first seven verses today. Jesus continues the parable with the second half in 7 through 14. And that's what we're going to come back and look at next week. And so between the two, I believe we see there is a right way to RSVP and there is a wrong way to RSVP. That there is a very wrong way to respond to the invitation that this king has sent out. And that's what we see in this first half. And so today, that's what I want us to do. We're going to look at the wrong ways to RSVP, and we're going to take those initials in our point. So number one, the wrong way to RSVP, you'll see that you have to refuse the invitation repeatedly. You say, I want to, I want to respond in the wrong way. Well, that's what we see in the first seven verses. So just model what these people did as they get this invitation and servant after servant comes and tells them the feast is ready. The king's waiting. It's all prepared. It's the, it's the most lavish feast you can imagine. Well, if you want to respond the wrong way, refuse it time and time again. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I prepared my dinner, the, the oxen, the calves, it's all slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. I said a couple weeks ago when we interpret parables, we need to try to put ourselves into this original audience. How would they have responded? We know what a wedding is like in American culture. We know that most of the time it's an afternoon, an evening, a couple hours. We'll sit through a, a short ceremony. We'll go to a reception. Maybe there's some dancing, but then it's all pretty compact. That was not the case here. A wedding in this time, in this culture, this was a seven-day, all-inclusive event that if you went to somebody's wedding, you were there for the week, and you celebrated, and they fed you, and they put you up, and so you got to think, that's just anybody's wedding. This is the wedding for the king's only son. And they got that type of invitation, and their response is, eh. Their response is, I'm busy. Their response is over and over and over again, this repeated action. That's why I put that, to refuse the invitation repeatedly. That when you study in the actual verb tense in those verses, the action stresses a repeated refusal. That it's these servants are going out, and it's not just, hey, a one and done. They're, they're asking, you need to come. No. You need to come. No. You need to come. No, why, why will you not come? And it's this repeated refusal. One commentator I read pointed out that this would have been a, a deliberate insult against the king. That the wording is repeated back to us in Matthew 23, verse 37, where Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. And the wording in chapter 23 is very similar to this parable here in 22, where Jesus looks out over Jerusalem and he says this in verse 37, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that does what? That kills the prophets and stones those who are sent. Does that sound familiar in our parable? How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing and you were not willing? You were not willing. That 2337 could be translated, and you would not come. Over and over, how many times would I have gathered you in? How many times was I standing ready to offer grace and to bring you back in, and you would not come? And I think there's such a huge distinction that we need to make sure we have crystal clear in that. That it's not that they could not, it's that they would not. Imagine you invite someone to your wedding, and they... Say, oh, man, man, I'm so sorry. I wish I could, but I can't. I'm going to be out of the country. I can't. I'm having surgery the day before, and I, I, I can't be there. There's a big difference between that heart and you inviting someone, and they say, I don't want to come. I don't want to spend the day with you. You're not worth me sacrificing an afternoon or an evening. 
It's not that I cannot, I will not, because I don't want to. That's the heart of them rejecting the king. That is what they are trying to get this message across. James Montgomery Boyce agrees. He said this of these verses. He said the unique element in the parable of the wedding banquet is the willful refusal of those who are invited. It's not that they could not come. Rather, they would not come. In other words, they would not come because they actually despised the king. I hate you, and I don't want to come to you. I don't want to surrender to you. I don't want to listen to you. I'm going to rule and reign my life. That's what they were saying, and how many of you know that's what so many of us say so many times. I'm going to rule and reign my life. I'm going to call the shots. I will dictate my decisions. I will set my own schedule. I will rule and reign. And how many of you know, though, that when we try that, we will always run the kingdom into the ground? It will never end up good. We will never actually succeed ruling and reigning as king in our own lives. But in our sin and in our rebellion so many times, this is the response to refuse to surrender, to refuse to obey, really, the command of the king in verse 4. Did you pick up that shift? That he sends out these invitations, and finally, in verse 4, he says that this is shifted from, hey, you should receive the invitation to the end of verse 4. What does he say? Come to the wedding feast. I'm a messenger of the king, and now come is a command. Come to the feast. We've been more than gracious. We've been more than merciful and patient. Here's the deal. At the end of the day, he's the king and you're the subjects and I'm telling you, come. If not, there's consequences when we disobey the commands of a king. Like we know this in so many different ways, shapes, and forms. I I compared it to how many parents do we have in the room? Raise your hand, all the parents all around. Hey, raise your hand. They can raise their hands right there. Chandler and Avery, they're parents now. There's a way you come into a room and maybe ask your kids a question. It is in a question form. To my sons, we'll say hypothetically, hey, guys, can you take out the trash? That would imply in the form of the sentence that there are two options that you could say. It would imply that you can say no. You can say no, but the current status of your life doesn't stay the same (laughs) if you say no. Hey, can you take the clothes up to your room now that they're folded and put them away? Seems like you could say yes or no, but, but there's one right answer. Is it there? There's one correct response, and that's the same thing here. The king has said, come. You can say no, but there's consequences. And that's the point of this message. That's the wrong way to RSVP. And that's what we see here, that there were consequences, were there not, to disobeying the command of the king. How many of us are in that same place in our life? Repeatedly refusing to receive the invitation to submit to the commands. Where are you? Are you saying, I will not? Are you willing to step off of that throne, to bow your knee to the true king and receive this incredible invitation? Or is it as Douglas O'Donnell said, he said in verse 2 through 7, we heard rejection, rejection. If you read in the Gospel of Luke's account, it's rejection, rejection, rejection. He says in the Gospel of Thomas, and in his commentary, he says, bear with me, because it's an extra-biblical account that he's just saying, I'm just showing you an example of a similar story. He says, but there it's rejection, 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 rejection. So whether it's two or three or four, there's repeated rejections. The king's gracious offer. And as a messenger... From the king, that's what I feel in these sermons especially, to please respond. To see that the king is offering you forgiveness. He's offering you new life. 
He's offering to bring you into his family, a seat at his table that is better than anything you could ever drum up in and of yourself. The wrong way is to refuse it. Number two, we see the second way is to stick with your own schedule. You want to respond in the wrong way? Then just stick to your own schedule. I got things to do, people to see, and it doesn't have you scheduled in. That's what happens. They, they, they don't listen to the response, and, and then it says, but they paid no attention in verse 5. And they went off, one to his farm, another to his business. I believe this is teaching and showing us that their own personal pleasures, their own pursuits were more important than listening to the king. Does that sound familiar? If we were honest, that so many times, I, no, 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 I got my own schedule. I got my own plans. I know where I'm going and what I'm going to accomplish and what I know. If I, if I just get that, then that one, that will satisfy, and I'm headed after it, and nothing's going to stand in my way. And even though it sounds familiar when you say it out loud, how insane does it sound? That we could think anything in our own schedule, in our own pursuits is better. Listen, they're going to the farm or to their business to work. You could be in the king's palace. You, you could be at the greatest event that you've ever, the greatest celebration that you could ever imagine. And you chose to go work. You chose to just pursue your own schedule. It was the genius of C.S. Lewis that put it this way. He said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures. We're fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. And then he gives us a little parable, if you will. He said, we're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Pleased to sit in a slum and slap the mud around. Thinking that it's going to satisfy. Thinking that it's good enough when the king is standing offering us to come to his table. To come into his kingdom. To do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ask, think, imagine. That, that he wants to move in our lives. Yet we stick to our own schedule so many times. I pray that we would stop pursuing that farm or that business and start dining with the king more. It was the prophet Isaiah who said in Isaiah 55, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Now, how does that happen? How do you come and buy when you have no money? Because it's going to go on the king's tab. <laughs> we see my father has it. He has it. And he's going to provide for his people. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Here's the question. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread? Why do you labor for that which will not satisfy? Listen diligently to me. Come and eat what is good. Delight yourself in the rich food. I love one translation. It says, delight yourself in the richest affair." that image I have of the king's banquet table. More lavish and overflowing with the finest of foods imaginable. And that's the picture of what he's inviting us to. And yet how many times do we just get pulled in so many different ways and run after things that are not going to satisfy? I gotta go to the farm. I, I gotta run to the business. I, I gotta go do this or that. One pastor I read uh, described it and compared it to the, as we're in our busyness and business, being pulled in all these different ways to the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. Anybody remember that? I see some heads nodding. You know, taking you back to your childhood, watching this old cartoon. It came out in 1951. But if you don't know the scene, Alice is there in Wonderland, and, and the white rabbit comes frantically through. He's checking his watch, and he's in this panic state, and he begins to sing a song where he says, what? I'm late. I'm late for a very important date. No time to say hello, goodbye. I'm late. I'm late. I'm late. How many of you that's going to be in your head the rest of the day? <laughs> but if we're honest, that's the theme song to our lives. 
That we wake up in the morning just like the white rabbit frantically. I'm late. I'm late for a very important date. I'm late and when I wave, I lose the time I save. My fuzzy ears and whiskers took me too much time to shave. I run and then I hop, hop, hop. I wish that I could fly. There's danger if I dare to stop. And here's the reason why. I'm overdue. I'm rabbit stew. I can't even say goodbye. Hello, I'm late. I'm late. I'm late. That could be the theme song for every single one of our lives. I'm late, i got to run over here, i got to do that, and, and we're missing out with just, just pulling up to the table with the king. What does it matter if we show up at the right time for the wrong things? That's the story of so many people. You're showing up for the right time because I'm frantically running, but it's the wrong thing. What does it matter? Again, it was Douglas O'Donnell who said it better than I can when he said this. He said, good people are doing their good work but are ignoring the good news of their great God. And that might possibly be the most damning influence in the world today. Don't miss this last line. Don't let your occupation preoccupy your soul. Don't lose your life making a living. It was Jesus' words in Mark 8, was it not? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? That, oh, yeah, maybe you made a great living, but you lost your life. What have you won? You've lost everything in the end. These ones in the parable, they may have had the greatest farm you've ever seen, the most profitable business imaginable, but eventually it ran out, and it was no good because they missed the invitation to come to the king If you want to respond in the wrong way, set your own schedule. Number three, we see violently attack the messengers. The third wrong way is to violently attack the messengers. That's what happened. While the rest seized the servants, verse 6, treated them shamefully and killed them. And at first, like, that kind of shocks you in the story because the parable's going along and there's this invitation and they refuse it. We get that, but who take his servants and kill them? Are you kidding? Who's going to respond this way to servants of the king? Like, that doesn't really fit Jesus. Yes, it does. Think about the story of Scripture from start to finish and how the messengers and the prophets of God, the the apostles and the, the people that God has sent out, think about how they've all been treated from start to finish. They seized them, treated them shamefully. Elijah... It's called the troublemaker of Israel by King Ahab. Isaiah was historically believed to have been cut in two. Jeremiah is said to have been stoned to death. John the Baptist, who was the forerunner, just you know, making way for Christ to come on the scene, of who Jesus said, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. And yet, do you know what happened to him? He had his head cut off. And served on a platter for a wicked king. Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, preaching the message of the gospel, right after what what happens to him, he's martyred for his faith and sharing a message from the king. Jesus is looking at these religious leaders and saying, this is exactly what you've always done. And what you're going to continue to do in rebellion and opposition against the message of the true king. We didn't even get to the apostles yet. We didn't even get to the ones that followed and were sent out. It it went terrible for them physically. I use this a lot, but I think it's worth repeating over and over again. I used it in the first service. I feel like God used it in many people's lives. I had several come up to me afterwards and say, what was that reference again? Where can I find that? It's, It's in a book called All In by Mark Batterson where he writes about this is what happened to the apostles. This is what happened to the messengers of God as they were sent out inviting people to come into the kingdom. In AD 44, King Herod ordered that James the Greater be thrust through with a sword. He was the first of the apostles to be martyred, and so the bloodbath began. Luke was hung by the neck from an olive tree in Greece. At the end of John 20, you can read about doubting Thomas. He felt the place in Jesus' side where the spear had been thrust into it. Ironically, Thomas was pierced with pine spears. 
tortured with red-hot plates, and burned alive in India. In AD 54, the proconsul of Hierapolis had Philip tortured and crucified because his wife had converted to Christianity while listening to Philip preach. Philip continued to preach while on the cross. Matthew was stabbed in the back in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was flogged to death in Armenia. James the Just was thrown off the southeast pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. He survived the 100-foot fall but was clubbed to death by a mob at the bottom. Simon the Zealot was crucified by the governor of Syria in AD 74. Judas Thaddeus was beaten to death with sticks in Mesopotamia. Matthias, who replaced Judas Iscariot, was stoned to death and then beheaded. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, was crucified upside down at his own request. John is the only disciple to die of natural causes, but that's only because he survived his own execution when a cauldron of boiling oil could not kill John. Emperor Diocletian exiled him to the island of Patmos, where he lived until his death in AD 95. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Sounds like Matthew 22, 6 was very prophetic, does it not? When you hear how history played out for the messengers of God. And to think, for us who have received the invitation, it is in large part to sacrifices like saints that we just read. That the message was carried on even in the face of being tortured and crucified and beheaded and boiled alive. And guess what? They were still going to preach the message. Respond, please, and come into the kingdom of heaven. We should be grateful for sacrifices, martyrs like them. And I believe it should motivate us to go on mission. That we're worried about how someone may respond when we share the gospel with them. These people were doing it in the face of certain death. Because the invitation's worth getting out to push through whatever opposition it may be. You, you might hear that and go, well, I'm not going to violently attack you. I'm not going to kill somebody. But maybe within you, it's just this violent opposition inside that I will not surrender. I will not listen. I, I will not give in. I will not abdicate and get off of that throne. Well, guess what? It, it's just going back to the first wrong response, and you're refusing. And you're setting your own schedule. And you're violently opposed to surrendering. And here's the last point. The result of all this is that punishment is the result. Punishment is the result for having these wrong responses time and time and time again. What does verse 7 say? The king was angry, as he should be. He has given out this gracious offer over and over and over again. He's prepared this feast that they don't deserve to come to, but in his grace, he's invited them in, and their response is to be too busy and to kill his servants. And so for those who hear this verse and kind of push back against it, I'm like, do you not understand what they did? Do we not see this response? The king was angry, and rightfully so. He sent his troops, destroyed the murderers, and burned their city. I know there can be pushback to this. I think it's ironic, especially in our culture, where it's like any time you read about anger of God, they get angry at God. They think, oh my goodness, he's so unjust, when all he's doing is seeking justice. So what I talked about a couple weeks ago when I talked about grace and how grace isn't fair. If you want what's fair, that's fair. You killed my servants. I'm the king. That's what's right. And so many times people will think, man, if you show any wrath of God, then there must not be any love. That we want him banished from our lives when we see that he will punish sin. That if this is your response to constantly refuse, set your own schedule, violently respond, that's, that's the result. 
again, I love the way C.S. Lewis, he pegged it perfectly for us when he said this. He said, what would really satisfy us would be a God who said of anything that we happen to like doing, what does it matter so long as they're contented? That's what we want. We want, in fact, not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven. We don't want a king. We want a genie. I want you to do what I want, when I want it, how, and I don't want there to be any pushback. We want a grandfather in heaven, not a father. I told the first service, my dad was in the room, so I'm not talking bad about him behind his back. He was there. I said it to his face. I'll say it to you guys. If you don't understand that quote from C.S. Lewis, then you probably didn't have a strict earthly father. Good, but strict, who then became a grandfather. Because there's a world of difference between these two places. My, my dad, the Allen men, Chandler can say amen to this. He knew my grandpa, my uncles, Allen men, they're, they're good dads, but they are strict. And then they become grandfathers. And I'm like, where'd that guy go? There have been so many times with my five kids when they're interacting with my dad and I'm kind of in the shadows in the background and I see something happening or I see something said to him in a way that I know, uh uh-oh, it's about to go down. And I'll just stay back and I'll just kind of watch and wait like, oh, he's about to get it. And then you know what happens? Nothing. And I want to jump out and scream and go, what in the world? Who are you? I would have died three times before I blinked and they got away scot-free. You know what happened? Became a grandfather. Scott knows. <laughs> we want that. We want a heavenly grandfather. Guess what? We don't have a heavenly grandfather. We have a heavenly father that is good and gracious and loving, but can I tell you, he is powerful and he is just and he is true and he is holy and he will not put up with sin. It will be punished. But here's the good news. You don't have to take the punishment. The good king who tells us this parable about the wrath of the king went to the cross to take on that wrath in your place. So you don't have to take the punishment. There's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he took the punishment for us. If I just stopped and said, uh, there's punishment for this, that would be very bad news. But there is a good news that we preach that God paid the price on our behalf. And you may have had a million wrong responses. You may have spit in his face time and time again. You may have set your own schedule and been so violent and so angry and so against him, but guess what? He's standing there knocking, waiting for you to open the door and let him come in. To receive you in as his own. To forgive everything. And make you a place at the table. Here and now, and then and there. It was Paul who wrote in Ephesians 2. I love this because he tries to get our attention and let us know you got to remember where you were. He's speaking to Christians and he's saying, don't forget where you were. We're going to get to that more next week as he goes out to the crossroads and brings in all those that know they don't deserve to get invited in. And Paul says, you need to remember where you were before you received the invitation and accepted it, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenant's promise. That's what we need to remember, that we had no hope and we were without God. But, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We've brought, been brought in. He goes on in verse 19. He says, so you're no longer strangers and aliens. Guess what? You're fellow citizens with the saints. You get to be members of the household of God. We're not just invitees to the party. He puts us into the family. We become co-heirs. It's unbelievable the good news of the grace of God that he invites us into. So I'll start with how I finished. Have you RSVP'd? And I would ask as a messenger from the king, respond, please. 
with your heads bowed, eyes closed, but, but hearts open, listening, responding to what God may be saying and doing. That if you've never responded, I, I, I plead with you, respond, please. Accept the invitation. Call out to God right where you sit and say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. And I don't deserve it and I couldn't earn it, but thank you that you invite me into your family. I want to receive you as Lord. I want to receive you as my Savior and my King. I want to experience this new life and follow you for the rest of my days. I pray that you would respond today to know that we don't know what tomorrow holds. I think of a story by Charles Spurgeon that you can imagine as you sit there in this posture of responding. He tells the story of a Christian who visited a friend who was a shipping merchant. He loved him enough to, to care for him, to share the gospel with him, to invite him to respond. And the Christian asked the merchant, well, sir, what is the state of your soul? To which the merchant replied, soul? I have no time to take care of my soul. I barely have enough time to take care of my ships. Spurgeon concluded the story by saying, but he wasn't too busy to die which he did one week later. Go back to the other quote. He, he was busy making a living and he lost his life. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? The invitation has been extended. I pray that you would please respond. Father, I pray right now that you would move in this place draw in hearts, minds, lives to accept this invitation. God, for, for so many here who have already, God, I pray that you would be stirring in our hearts on how we're preparing for the celebration. Lord, excitement, anticipation, looking and longing for our King to return and for a, a true feast to happen. Father, as we sing this song, I pray that it would be true. Make us more like Jesus. It's in his name I pray.